The Industrial Revolution brings to mind images of dark satanic mills and smoking chimneys and crowded towns. We all know that the workers had a pretty rough time, but until you see some of the jobs they actually did, you don't realise quite how awful things were for them. Some worst jobs spring immediately to mind, like the workers in the cotton mills, or the men who laid the track for Britain's amazing railway network, or the hot and dangerous job of producing iron and steel, the basic building blocks of the Industrial Revolution. But for me, the worst are ones you might not have thought of. Anonymous workers who ensured that the great icons and geniuses of the Industrial Revolution went down in history. I mean, we've all heard of Isambard Kingdom Brunel and the Clifton Suspension Bridge, but he'd have been nowhere without the terrifying job of bridge builder. Before the Industrial Revolution, no one would have dreamt of spanning a gorge like this with a traditional wooden or stone bridge. And then along came Brunel with new technology and brand spanking new designs for a suspension bridge, and the job was done. But it was this very pushing at the boundaries of engineering that made the job of bridge building much, much worse. John, how did they actually build this? Well, first of all, you have to build the abutments and the towers. Yeah. And to a degree, that's the easy bit. Except, imagine how you're going to get all that stonework on top of these cliffs. Then the really difficult bit is putting the bridge across itself. So how do you start? You've got to get a platform the same shape as the chain from one side to the other. And that was done with three wire ropes and then strapping a wooden platform to it. You then laid each of the plates of the links onto this platform and starting at both ends at the same time. And when you reach the middle, you put the pin in and you've got a thin chain. But until you've got that chain, you've got nothing underneath you, have I you? I know. This is a very dangerous place to be. You know, I wouldn't have liked to have been anywhere near it. You can imagine that first conversation between Brunel and his bridge builders. Yes, a small wooden walkway from the top. No, nothing to hang on to. Oh, thanks, Isambard. The bad news for me is that people still have to go up to check the cables. It's a frightening echo of the original bridge builder's job. What looks like a solid walkway is a series of chains that waft in the wind. Why do I need a helmet? If I fall all the way down to the River Avon, it's not going to matter much whether I've got a helmet on or not. Mind you, we haven't got a boat for you either, uh, don't <laughs> There we go. How high are we? Well, I'm 250 feet off the water, Tony. Uh, you're going to go higher and higher. But don't worry about it. You're gloating. I can hear it in your voice. <laughs> right. Am I OK to come up? Yeah. This safety wire has only been in place for eight years. With no handrail, it does nothing to stop the feeling that you might fall off. The thing you're most terrified of when you first get up is that you're going to fall and get run over by a car. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. And then you look over the other side <laughs> and you think actually being mowed down by a car would be infinitely preferable. <laughs> if you do fall off and the cord holds, you hang like a conker until a qualified abseiler's brought in to rescue you. The original builders weren't so lucky. At least two fell to their deaths during construction. It is a long way, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is. Can you imagine if there wasn't a road here, Tony? Just as the guys, when they were building it, there wouldn't have been a road. It would have been straight down to the water. <laughs> and they wouldn't have had one of these no, they the wouldn't. Is on, would they? There was nothing to hold them on. It's the way the wind keeps changing that's really unnerving. You you just think you've got, you've got it. You you understand about the wind, and then the damn thing gusts in a completely different direction. It's really swirly, isn't it? Even on a relatively calm day, the gorge acts like a wind tunnel. It gets much worse. In 1863, a freak gust blew the fragile wooden walkway and the men on it 70 feet in the air. Incredibly, they all lived to tell the tale. I'd have needed a change of underwear. After a while, you begin to get the hang of being up there. 
but taking your hands off the rope and bolting the giant pieces of chain together would feel like suicide. It's a huge relief when the section's checked and you start coming down. This iconic bridge made Brunel immortal. And although his bridge builders died anonymous, this is also their monument. For millions of other forgotten workers beetling away in the world of industry, there was no such consolation, as their jobs got worse and worse. Industry is useless without transport. In an age of poor roads and no railways, moving goods was a huge problem. The answer was a monumental engineering project. Between 1760 and 1850, navvies dug nearly 5,000 miles of canals to carry 30 million tons of cargo. But barges didn't have engines. Keeping the freight moving created a unique worst job. This is all very calm and peaceful and idyllic, isn't it? Except that this was the M1 of its day. All the way along here, there would have been queues of barges waiting to get through to the far side of the Pennines so they could deliver their goods to the mills and factories. Why were they queuing here? Well, it's easy to pull a barge along by horse when you've got a towpath, but when you get to that tunnel, there was no towpath, so no horse. And at that moment, in the best traditions of the worst jobs in history, the job was taken over by a poor employee of the canal, company whose task it was to drag the barge all the way through that tunnel using only the power of his legs and he was known as the legger. Fred? Yes. Can I go on your boat? You certainly can, Tony. Listen, why did they build the tunnel so narrow? If they built it wider, you could have put a towpath down the side and then a horse could have dragged the barges through. One of the things is the cost. I mean, initially they said this tunnel would cost about £56,000. The figure actually went up to £125,000. If you can imagine the extra expense of putting the towpath in here as well. It's like the Channel Tunnel, isn't it? Just a bit, yeah. How long is this thing? Three and a quarter miles. It's the longest, highest, deepest canal tunnel yeah. in this country. Oh, right. Stop boasting. <laughs> So I'm going to have to pull this boat three and a half miles. You certainly are, Tony. Come on, then. Do I get up on here? Yes, you do. I'll just throw this rope forward, Tony. Right. One now. Yeah. Right. What I want to do now yeah. is line your back here with your feet onto that side of the tunnel. Line my back? Certainly line your back. Nice straight position. Feet onto the side of the tunnel, just so you can reach nicely. Yeah. Just leave a bit of room for me. Yeah. You got your feet onto the side of the tunnel? Uh, yeah, I have right. that, yeah. Take sideways steps now, That's like it. a crab. Right. That's the one. Oh, it's moving. That's it. Just that, we've got to get a, get a move in first. Oh, stuck. So just push. Yeah. Nice, easy pressure. One leg, then the other, like yeah. a crab. Just keep it going. This is the first worst job I've ever done on my back. Oh, yeah, you can feel it actually in the uh, in the muscles between your knees and your ankles, can't you? You can imagine how you're going to be after the next three miles then. <laughs> this tunnel is the Mount Everest of legging. Even though the barge moves smoothly, we're pushing the equivalent of a loaded articulated lorry. How long would it have taken them to get through this tunnel? About three and a half to four hours to take a boat through this tunnel. But you didn't need someone who was specially qualified to do this, did you? Anyone could have done it. The bloke off the boat could have done it. The, the trouble with that is the what we call the, the non-professionals would actually take longer, sometimes up to four and a half hours. And this did actually cause, a, like a bottleneck, a traffic jam on the tunnel. So they brought professional leggers in just to speed the boats through the tunnel, really. So these were professional guys who worked for the company and the only job that they did was legging all day long? That's correct, yeah, but they did actually speed the traffic up. They could leg a boat through here in sometimes just under three hours. How much did they get? It varied a little bit. I mean, mostly they got about one and six, about seven and a half new pence per boat. Well, that would have been quite a lot in those days. Yeah, it? some of it did depend on the cargoes that they actually carried. Do they ever catch their feet between the boats and the side? It does seem a bit precarious. I wish you'd imagine that they would quite easily, Tony. There are bits sticking out, there are hollers, 
there are ledgers and they were bringing a, a cargo of limestone and one of the leggers actually missed the footing and the boat actually bumped the cargo shifted just enough to cause the boat to take on water yeah and unfortunately it did sink they sent a backup boat in and they found the crew obviously quite wet but quite happily stood on the roof of the boat at the end of the grinding three-hour plod through the tunnel the leggers had to pick up another cargo at the other end and do the whole thing over again so how bad a job is this well I'm lying here, nattering away to Fred. It's a nice breeze coming down the tunnel. The bad bits are the water that keeps splashing into your face. That's not too bad. But the worst thing is just here. Those muscles just underneath the knee are screaming with agony. I've only been doing it for 10 minutes. So I'll put you back into it. 